And while you're doing that, I'm going to have everyone else turn to the book of Mark, chapter 15. Mark chapter 15 is where we are. So they're in the children's area. Okay, over there. Got it. (laughs) As soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. And they bound Jesus and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate. And Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, You have said so. And the chief priests accused him of many things. And Pilate asked him again, Have you no answer to make? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further answer so that Pilate was amazed. Now at the feast he, Pilate, used to release for them one prisoner for whom they asked. And among the rebels in prison who had committed murder in the insurrection there was a man called Barabbas. And the crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do as he usually did for them. And he answered them saying, do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he perceived that it was out of envy that the chief priests had delivered him up. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have him release for them Barabbas instead. And Pilate again said to them, Then what shall I do with the man you call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him. And Pilate said to them, Why, what evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas. And having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. This is the word of the Lord. Would you pray with me? Father, by your Spirit, help us today to see our Lord Jesus Christ. And all the ways who he is and what he does here intersects our lives today. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, Some of you, like me, um, may have grown up watching Perry Mason. Some of you are my age and above will go, oh yeah, I remember Perry Mason. Some of you are younger going, Perry who? Um, One of the first courtroom drama shows. You can still watch it, I think. YouTube might have it. Uh, And I grew up loving courtroom drama because I watched Perry Mason and then it went on to Matlock, Matlock and And then there have been John Grisham novels, and courtroom dramas are a lot of fun. And we are landing in this passage in Mark in the middle of the second half of a courtroom drama. Uh, Lucas walked us through the opening part where the Jewish court is convened after Judas betrays Jesus to them. And the theme of that trial is a verdict looking for evidence. They'd already reached their conclusion. They just wanted to come up with some reason to base it on. So... Bribe false witnesses. False witnesses had a hard time agreeing with each other. Usually liars have a hard time lying in unison. Uh, Every one of the due process rights Jesus had was violated repeatedly. They announced the verdict, blasphemy. They announced the sentence, he deserves death. That's where it ends. And that's fine, except for a couple problems. Problem number one, the Jews had no right to execute anyone under Roman law. Only the Roman governor could do that. Problem number two, the charge of blasphemy meant nothing to Pilate. Pilate would have said, just go solve your own problems. It's an irrelevant point to a Roman. And number three, Pilate and the Roman, Pilate and the Jewish leaders hated each other. So this is a bit of a thorny problem. Well, apparently, without going into all the details, Mark wants us to know that they figured it out. They modified the charge, not blasphemy, but king of the Jews. That'll do it. He's an insurrectionist. He's a dangerous man. He's a revolutionary. And then they bound him up like he was going to hurt somebody and sent him away to Pilate, having notified him of the charges. And that brings us to this passage. And we're going to look at three things in the passage. The facts, the motives, and the meaning. The facts. Just so you understand and you remember that as Jesus is being marched off to Pilate, he is alone. All his friends have abandoned him. They have denied him, they have betrayed him, 
and they have abandoned him. So he is walking alone into this trial. Uh, The first five verses of the trial are kind of a quick summary of what happens. Very briefly described. Mark doesn't get into the gory details. Uh, The Jews apparently, to make it look good, reconvened the Sanhedrin and came to their official conclusion after daylight began because you weren't allowed to pass a verdict at night. So let's dress this thing up and make it look like it's righteous. Pilate has Jesus appear before him and having been prompted by the Jews, he asks, are you the king of the Jews? That's the theme of Mark. Jesus' answer is deliberately vague. Well, it is what you say. Well, Pilate's thinking, is that a yes or a no? And the answer is, yes, it is. It's, yes, I am a king, but no, I'm not that kind of king. Well, frustrated with the lack of clarity they're getting out of Jesus, the religious leaders decide to pile on. So Mark describes the language of as they kept accusing him and Jesus kept not responding. So they're just throwing accusations at him in front of Pilate and Jesus never answers. So much so, Pilate's amazed. He's, a, he's an experienced judge who had never seen anyone respond that way to those kinds of accusations. He's amazed. Pilate's also trapped now. <laughs> He's, he's got the Jewish leaders who brought a man before him who's accused of being the king of the Jews, and that demands action. He's also got a crowd forming in front of him that wants something. He doesn't know what, and crowds and Passover and Jewish governor or Roman governors don't tend to create peaceful settings. He hates the Jews. The Jews hate him. He's not sure what to do, but he gets a brainstorm, and so Mark turns us to the next section, verses 6 to 15. Pilate realizes that there's this custom of the Jewish people asking for one of their prisoners, one of the prisoners of a Jewish prisoner who had been taken by Rome to be released. And he thinks, huh, so they're going to want somebody to be released. I know they brought Jesus to me out of envy. They just don't like him because he makes them look bad. He's too popular. And he says, I think this is a great opportunity. I'm going to stick a finger in the eyes of the Jewish leader placate the mob and get this mess off of my hands. So his scheme is very simple. They want me to release somebody, I'm going to give them two options. A violent, murderous man or the man who five days before was thronged and celebrated as he came into the city. Seems like a pretty obvious choice, right? They'll pick Jesus, I'm out of the hole, the Jews have me, I've just annoyed the Jews, which I love to do, and I can go off and go fishing. Or I'm going down to Caesarea, which is where the Romans went when they wanted to have a good time. The problem is he got outplayed. The Jewish leaders in the crowd started some kind of a whispering campaign, we can only guess, that stirred the crowd to ask for Jesus' death. So verses 12 to 15, you have Pilate dealing with the crowd, and he, he simply says to them, what do you want me to do with your king? So he's, he's acknowledging Jesus as king, and they, they don't want Jesus, they want Barabbas to be released. He declares Jesus innocent. He repeats this process multiple times, and then he says, can't do a thing about it. I'm going to give him Barabbas. I gave him a choice. They picked the murderer, and I'm going to hand Jesus over to be crucified. Now, I always want to remind people, a cross is not a piece of jewelry. Not in the Roman world. The cross was the most humiliating form of death imaginable. If you crucified somebody in the Roman world, your goal was to erase their memory from the world. To so humiliate them and so shame them that no one would ever mention them again. So Pilate hands Jesus over to be shamed and humiliated and put to death. Those are the facts. False accusation, abuse of power, violation of due process, injustice, playing politics with a human life, the usual course of the way things look. What are the motives? You know, to have a murder, you know, I've followed enough crime shows to know you need motive, means, and opportunity. What's the motive? Got all kinds of motives going here. Let's go back to those religious leaders. Their primary motive is to get rid of Jesus. He's a pain in the neck. He won't submit to them. He won't do things the way they want. He's making them look bad. And they want to do it in a way that looks pretty righteous. So they they have all kinds of schemes to make wickedness look good. 
They're willing to make a few moral compromises along the way, like accusing him of something he didn't do and then killing him. They have a sense of power, but they also have a sense of being threatened because after all, the one they're accusing is the one who raised the dead. So maybe he's going to pull something. And by the way, they hate Pilate. Pilate hates him back. That's what's going on in Pilate. He hates the back. He thinks the Jews are a nuisance. He wants to get on with more important things in his day. He really is committed to Roman law, except when he doesn't need to be because it might be inconvenient. And what about the mob? What about the crowd? What's, what's going on in their motives? Well, a mob is a symphony of angry people looking for some way to express their anger together. Mobs do not gather to build housing for the poor. Mobs are a group of angry people, and these people were there and they were mad. It doesn't matter what they were mad about. They, were, they may have been mad about Roman rule. They may have been mad at their poverty. They may have been mad about Jesus being passive. They may have been mad at their spouse or their kids or their parents or their indigestion. We don't know. All that matters is they're mad, and all it takes is one match thrown into the fire of their anger to ignite a mob, and Pilate knows it. It's a toxic mess, isn't it? Corrupt actions, corrupt motives, people in power, mob with power. But here's the end of it. Religious humanity, secular humanity, political power, ordinary people take the king that God has appointed for them as the savior, measure him in the scales and find him worthless. Less than worthless. And they're now going to rid the world of him. Wow, that's what's going on here. So, what's the meaning of this? Uh, one of my friends says, you read the Gospels to get the news, you read the Epistles to get the opinion page. Meaning, the, used to be that way. Um, so you get the news, and then you get the interpretation of the news. Well, the rest of the New Testament gives us the meaning. The rest of the Bible gives us the meaning to these events. Not any act of injustice, not any person being treated with injustice, but there are distinct things going on here. And Mark is highlighting what is unique here using the same phrase twice. Mark 14.61, in the Jewish trial, he, Jesus, remained silent and made no answer. Mark 15.5, before Pilate, but Jesus made no further answer so that Pilate was amazed. Why is that important? Well, here's what Mark is doing. He's jumping up and down, pointing at Jesus' silence, waving his hands, pointing a flashlight, big neon sign, saying, this should surprise you. Why should it surprise you? Well, 50 times in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus speaks. He teaches, he instructs, he rebukes, he corrects. He looks at a hurricane and says, stop. It stops. He looks at a man inhabited by a legion of demons. He says, out, and they go out. Now he's silent. Tongue-tied, doesn't know what to say, powerless, no, none of the above. Mark is telling us, taking us down a path to help us understand what's going on here. So there, there are a couple things here I want to talk about the meaning. And we're going to linger here, obviously, because I'm only 11 minutes into the sermon. First thing Mark wants us to understand and the New Testament wants us to understand is Jesus is finishing his appointed work here. He's finishing his appointed work. What does that mean? Let me introduce a theological term to you, the covenant of redemption. The covenant of redemption is a description of what Scripture speaks of, that in eternity past, before there was time, Father, Son, and Spirit purposed to redeem Sinners from the human race through the death of the eternal Son made man, who would as man be obedient unto death as a substitute for us in our sin. The Father gives his people to the Son. The Son redeems the people by his blood. The Holy Spirit calls them and forms them into a people. It's called the covenant of redemption was part of the eternal plan of God. Scripture tells us this was the plan of God from the beginning. The Old Testament predicts that in fulfilling this plan, the Savior would die just as he's dying here. Isaiah 53. 
Isaiah says, He would be wounded for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities. The Lord would lay on him the iniquity of us all, and here's what his death would look like. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like sheep that before it shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Mark is telling us, pointing to the silence of Jesus as the fulfillment of Jesus as Savior, as promised in the Old Testament and purposed by God before the worlds were made. That's why he came, to give his life a ransom for many. So this looks like a trial, an unjust trial by a religious court and a secular court of a man who was innocent of all the charges against him. Oh no, there's so much more going on here. God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are fulfilling a plan and purpose that began in eternity past the fruit of which will be an uncountable multitude of people gathered round their throne forever redeemed. And right here is where it's happening as the lamb who is to be slain goes silently to his death. That's why Jesus in the garden said, anticipating the dread of this sorrow, the dread of this punishment said, yet not what I will, but what you will. So Jesus is not a victim here. He is living in obedience to the purpose, the one purpose of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. His silence is not the silence of powerlessness. It is the silence of God's absolute power focused on the work of redemption. Jesus is going to submit to the false charges so that he might offer forgiveness to those who falsely charged him. He is going to submit to great injustice in order to fulfill justice and forgive sinners justly. So that's that's a lot to think about all by itself. Second thing you would get from the meaning of this passage that ties in with this is God is in control. God is at work. Um, God is at work to overrule the corrupt acts of corrupt leaders to accomplish their salvation. God is taking the greatest evil to accomplish the greatest good. What I mean by the greatest evil? I don't think the human race anywhere else tried to kill God. I would say that's the greatest evil. And now God is going to take an act of deicide, the attempt to kill God, and through it bring the redemption of an uncountable multitude. God is at work. They appear to be pulling the strings and making it happen. God oversees the whole thing. And Peter, using Peter's own words in the sermon in Pentecost in Acts 2.23, tells us it wasn't wasn't Judas that delivered Jesus up. It wasn't the religious leaders that delivered Jesus up. It wasn't Pilate who delivered Jesus up. This Jesus delivered up according to the determinate plan and foreknowledge of God. It was God the Father who delivered him up. So let me repeat, corrupt and evil actions committed for corrupt and evil motives will accomplish the purposes of God. To bring salvation to the corrupt, God will use the hateful actions of his enemies to transform them into forgiven sons and daughters. Isn't that amazing? (laughs) Who is like our God? That's why Paul says, oh, the depths of of the riches, of the wisdom and knowledge of God. God is working things out exactly as purposed for the purposes of redemption of an uncountable multitude using the most vile acts of men to turn them on their heads and show how great he is. This is why in the Heidelberg Catechism, I think it's question 26, we as believers grinding grounding our salvation in this kind of a God can say, I trust my Father so much that I do not doubt he can turn to my good whatever evil he sends me in this sad world, because he turned this evil into the redemption of an uncountable multitude. So surely he can handle the small bits of evil he sends me in this world. You can trust him. So the meaning of this is Jesus is obeying, fulfilling the purpose of God. God is at work, accomplishing all kinds of good through these vile acts. 
But there's a third one I, I, that I came to this week. I, I was looking at Peter's reflections on the trial, and I realized there's a third way in which this passage has meaning for us. And it's Jesus' example. Now, let me explain that to you. Uh, probably 40 years later, Peter was the pastor of a, a scattered group of Christians in what we would call today Turkey, modern Turkey, Pontus, Bithynia, Cappadocia. And he was their pastor, and they were living under Roman authority that was not friendly to them. That's probably the nice way to say it. It was more prejudicial to them. They were living under masters and bosses who treated them cruelly because they were Christians. And Peter calls what they're going through a fiery trial. They, they were losing possessions. They were suffering deeply, maybe even at the loss of their lives. The whole book of 1 Peter is written to them. And those Christians asked Peter, their pastor, a very practical question. How are we to respond each day to authority when that authority is exercised by weak, unjust, corrupt, and unbelieving people? Have you asked that question in the last few months? I've asked it. As I said to someone early on, I feel like a lab rat in an international experiment. How am I to respond when they make decisions I think are bad, when they do things for reasons that are obviously not for the good of all? Well, that's the question these brothers and sisters were asking. And here's what happened. In the church, there were all kinds of answers beginning to circulate among the believers there. Now, they didn't have social media, but they could talk, and these were communitarian people, so there was lots of talk. And guess what? Pretty soon, those answers began to circulate, and people began to argue. Christians began to argue with each other. Can you imagine? Causing division and conflict in the church. Sound familiar? Tell you that, if you want a painful experience, turn on Facebook and follow it. Um, it's not general stuff, Christian stuff. Because that's us. That's where my heart goes. So here's how Peter helps. He, he thinks, hmm, how do I speak these people about how to speak to these brothers and sisters about how to respond to authority when that authority is weak, unjust, corrupt, foolish, etc.? Got it. The trial of Jesus. So listen, right in the heart of his letter, here's what he says, verse 21. For to this, brothers and sisters, you have been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. Are you a savior, but he also leaves an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. No anger here. When he suffered, he did not threaten. Oh, I'll get you, Pilate. You just wait. But continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. Peter says, you want to understand how to respond? I'm going to take you to Jesus on trial. Jesus tortured. Jesus crucified. Because that's our example. He is your Savior, but he's also our pattern for obedience. For to this you have been called, he says, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example that you might follow in his steps, walk in the same steps he walked in. Now, I found these words so helpful this week, so I wanted to pass them on. What are his steps? Let me, let me just summarize them in a couple ways. First of all, they are steps of trust and patience. I, Rondi and I were taking a walk this week. I said, do you realize that Peter tells us what was going on in the heart of Jesus during his trial? She said, no. I said, yeah, it's right here. What was he doing when he was being maligned, slandered, hated, beaten, cruelly treated by people in authority? He was continually entrusting himself to him who judges justly. Wasn't mad, wasn't defiant, wasn't rebellious. He was entrusting himself to God. Trust. He, he knew who his God was from eternity past, but as true man, he was functioning in true faith. He knew God had appointed the leaders, that God had final authority. He knew that God was using corrupt authorities to accomplish his good purposes, so he looked beyond the visible to the invisible, and he kept entrusting himself to God. Now, how do I know he's doing that? How did Peter know that? Well, because it's not in Mark, but it is in John. 
There's this great place where Pilate looks at Jesus and says, don't you know I have authority to take away your life? <laughs> I'm important. And Jesus says, you got nothing if God didn't give it to you. And Pilate's thinking, nobody's ever told me that before. That's because Jesus had a big God and therefore a small people. He wasn't defined. He just said, Pilate, you're nothing. God's in charge. God is ruling. God is sovereign. God is working out his purposes. And it shows up in the details of how we respond. When we are treated unjustly or unfairly or subject to foolish or corrupt or whatever decisions, and not all decisions, not all leaders are fully corrupt, but they're all corrupt some because they're sinners. We trust God. We trust God. We don't live in fear. We don't live in foolishness, but we don't live in fear. So here's the question the Lord asked me this week. As I look at the daily input of my life, what I read, what I think about during the day, am I feeding my heart with the truth about God so that I trust him? Am I nurturing a reason to trust God? Or am I nurturing a reason to get ticked off? Because those are two different things, just in case you didn't know. And the other thing about Jesus is he waited with patience. How do I know that? Well, he was entrusting himself to God who judges justly. Well, what does that mean? He knows that nobody's going to get away with anything. God has the last word. So he may be unjustly accused and unjustly put to death, but that's not the last word. That's, that's not the last chapter of the book. God writes the last chapter of the book. So Jesus is patient. I hate being patient. Patient means dependent, not in control, waiting, not taking matters into my hands. I don't like that. Ask my wife. Jesus has the long view. See, impatience is when you want to call the game in the bottom of the fourth rather than wait until the last out in the bottom of the ninth. Let me tell you something, folks. When the last inning is played, in any situation you face in life, it's going to look a whole lot different than it does in the fourth inning. And Jesus is willing to trust God to make that clear. Patience. Faith and patience. Through faith and patience, inherit the promises. What marks out the people of God under these kinds of circumstances, says Peter, is following Jesus who walked a path of faith and patience. That's hard, isn't it? That's cer certainly not where a secular society is. The, the protesters on the streets are not exercising faith and patience, are they? They don't think God's going to bring justice, so they're going to make it happen now! I've, I've never seen somebody force God's hand in the church or in the world that it didn't damage far more people than solve a problem. I'm going to tell everybody the truth. Well, just go ahead and ruin lives then. That's impatience. Let God work. Leave room for God to work. I was reading Tertullian this week. I say, who is Tertullian? He's one of the Latin church fathers, wrote about the 180 AD. Uh, he and most of the main leaders of the early church for the first three centuries talked a lot about patience. And here's what Tertullian said. Impatience and anger are demonic. I, I think that's pretty fair. They're certainly not from God, so that means they must be from Satan. So again, the question I asked myself this week, how am I feeding my heart with the truth from God's word that encourage, encourages patient waiting? But Peter, and you need to read all of 1 Peter. I'm just hitting some highlights. It is a lovely, practical, helpful book. A life of following Jesus in faith and patience looks a certain way. And I'm going to give you the three ways that I thought of this week. First is a submissive heart. Peter wrote, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution. We are to be models of submission, not leaders or voices for the revolt. Not stirring things up, but being obedient and waiting for God to bring justice. 
God does not give us the option of evaluating the decisions and deciding which ones we agree with or not. How many of you parents would raise your kids that way? I don't think any parents would appreciate it if their kids say, Mom, Dad, we heard those three things you want us to do. We think one and two are okay, but we're not doing three. No, we, we, we follow those in authority, whether we agree with it or not. And the consensus of church history is that Christians in such circumstances most commend the gospel by being the most law-abiding citizens. In fact, the early church fathers, when they defended the church from persecution, said, look, we're your best citizens. We are not troublemakers. We do not resist. We do what you ask us to do. And they can do that because they're trusting God. God is over the authorities. God is working everything exactly as he's planned. Even through bad decisions, corrupt decisions. Now, they didn't have the option. We could make, if, they, if they were Roman citizens, they could make a lawful appeal. We can do that. But that's still obedience. We obey while trace patiently and trusting ourselves to God. Paul says, do all things without grumbling and disputing. Well, what fun is that? How am I feeding my heart? How are you feeding your heart with reasons to trust God, wait patiently, and submit? Second, fruit of faith and patience, a preserved unity. Peter writes, finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. I, for years, I... I read the places in the New Testament where the apostles are writing to a persecuted church, and I asked, why, why are they always encouraging unity? And I've, I've had some opportunity to work in places like Serbia, where the church was persecuted for years and still endures a fair amount of hostility from the government. And I've, I've learned, and I think we see it now, is that when pressures come, they poke us, don't they? And when they poke us, things are said and done that we don't usually say and do. Poking us reveals the idols of our heart. Maybe you're like me, you have an idol of convenience, an idol of routine, (laughs) an idol of politics, an idol of rights, an idol of freedoms. And we begin to find those idols starting to act in us and we begin to build our lives around our idol. And I, I wrote all kinds of them here. I'm, a, I'm pro-masks, I'm anti-masks. That's my identity. Really? Blood bought in Christ, that's your identity. I'm an anti-vaxxer. Really? That's important. I'm a virus minimizer, I'm a virus maximizer. I'm an anti-shutdowner, I'm a pro-shutdowner. Just read the news. Everybody is gathering around their idol and acting out. And guess what? It creeps into the church. And the result is contention and strife and judgments and pronouncements. And if we allow those idolatries and those arguments to come into the church, we will disrupt the blood-bought unity of the Spirit, which Paul says we are to die for. That's how much we're to fight for it. Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. The main thing is that the main thing always be the main thing. And the main thing, the basis of our unity is we confess the same God and Father, the same Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the same Spirit of God who unites us to Father and Son, the same redemption paid on the cross, the same forgiveness of sin, the same communion of the saints, the same everlasting destiny. That's the basis of our unity, even when we disagree on other things. So we can't let other things intrude into the main thing. So the question we should ask ourselves, and I should ask myself, is not how do I stand up for my rights and being right? The question we ask is how do I serve the vulnerable? Because guess what, folks? God isn't really interested in our opinions about the virus or the shutdowns or the politics or the media or anything. He's not. That's, he's, he gave his son to create one body in Christ, unified by the Spirit and the bond of peace. That took blood, the blood of God's Son. That's what he's interested in. I need that. 
Because I find if there's a fight over here that's going on on the media, I'm drawn into it. I'm like, oh, yeah, hit him. Go back. Take back. Right? People are attracted to a fight. You know, they can fight all they want. We are in Christ. We are God's people. We have a different identity. And when they're all bloody and killing each other, we can show up and show mercy. How do you like that? Because there are going to be a lot of refugees from this. And we get to be the places that welcome the refugees from the war. Third, third fruit, a life abounding in good works. Peter says it so many ways, for this is the will of God that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. <laughs> I love that. So here's what Peter's saying. People are going to say all, thing, all kinds of things against you. And here, here's what, you want to so abound in good works and love and service that people look at you and say, you, 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 you're such a, you, you keep doing good things. Would you stop because then I'd be able to say something bad about you. That's a lot of good works to silence. But it does happen. It does happen. When Cyprian, uh, bishop of Carthage in the middle of the third century, faced unbelievable persecution that ultimately took his life, an incredible warring of the Romans against the church and hostility towards each other, there was a plague in the city. And in those days, a plague been a plague, uh, I believe a third of the city died. And everyone fled. And Cyprian stood before God's people and he said, go back and care for the dying because you have no fear of death. And it turned the hearts of the people from being against the church for a period of time to being for the church. He silenced them. Silence their opposition. Uh, my friends in Serbia, under, under restrictions you would not, you and I don't understand, uh, when the shutdown occurred in Serbia, people over 65 were basically told if you step out of your apartment or go off your land, you'll be arrested and put in jail. And we don't know how long we'll keep you there. So you know what the Christians did? This 1% of the, po- 0.1% of the population, 7,000 known evangelical Christians in a land of 7 million people, they went out to the elderly people and said, can we get your groceries for you? It seems to be hard for you to get groceries since you're not allowed to leave your home. They did good. And it's brought opportunities for the gospel. You all, when, a few months ago, when Cortisone Ministries on the southwest side of town, we asked them, how can we serve our brothers and sisters in the Latino and Hispanic community? And Mike Alameda said, we are hit 20 times harder than you are on the east side with this virus. He said, I don't know any family that hasn't been affected. He said, they need groceries. So I, I got a list of names and I put out an email to you all. We needed 12 families. I had 14 in about 20 minutes. 14 of you just said, I'm going to do that. And I called up Mike. I said, I got more help than I know. He said, here's another 12 names. That was beautiful. So I know you want to do good. We need to ask God for opportunities to do good because that shows that we are trusting God and waiting with patience. Rincon family, myself included, God has brought you, us, me, into this season for his purpose at his hand for this time. He is working his will through people in authority even though you and I don't like what they say. or agree with what they say. He has called us preeminently to trust him, to patiently wait for his hand, to honor them, to love each other as brothers, and to do good. And most of all, as Peter says at the end of the letter, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. We are under the mighty hand of God. Christians are the only people that see it that way, but that is what we are. We are under the mighty hand of God. Humble yourselves under it. So notice, at the proper time, there's the waiting. There's the patience. In God's time, he may exalt you. But what do you do in the meantime? Casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Isn't that beautiful? So I trust, I wait, I follow, I submit, I love, I do good. 
And I have in my Father the one who can take the whole load of my anxieties from me because he loves me. Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you for this passage. I thank you for Peter. I thank you for these words to my heart this week. Lord, I know I speak for all of us here. We, we want to walk in a way that people say, wow, you act like you have a security that we don't have. You, you act like you think someone is in control. <laughs> you act to serve. We, we want to walk with you in such a way, Father, and to trust you and be patient for you that that is our life here and now, and that we as a church are one body united around big things, main things. Help us as the battle will go on. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.